Welcome to Interfaith Ministries Summer Series, The Dialogue Project, Vital Conversations with Our Community. For over half a century, three Houston faith leaders have been joining their voices and influence in support of civil rights. Archbishop Joseph Fiorenza, Rabbi Samuel Karf, and Reverend William Lawson found that when they stood together as a multi-faith trio, their presence and voice was more powerful than if any of them spoke out individually. The three friends joined forces in partnership with Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston to present a virtual discussion on fighting for justice, equality, and respect as part of Interfaith Ministries Summer 2020 series, The Dialogue Project, Vital Conversations with Our Community. This vital one-hour conversation and moment of prayer on racism, civil rights, and the struggle for a more just society aired Friday, June 19th. And in that June 19th opening conversation, one of the key themes addressed was about our duties to others and our relationship with others. Rabbi Sam Karf noted, while I have my own story and my own identity, my own way of relating to God, I'm also part of the larger story that unites us all as children of God. And I needed to go beyond the confines of my own group. That was going to be an important part of my ministry. It was not enough to focus on the specific issues of my own community, but I needed to relate to the issues that bind us together. Near the end of the conversation, two questions were asked of the trio. How do you feel people of faith can help make this a lasting change? How can people of faith really step out right now and help us make this a change for good? And how would you advise the general public to be an ally for the cause of equal rights for black people and people of color? Today, the Vital Conversations series will explore this intersection of religion and faith, especially in the goals of countering racism and inequality. And we welcome the Reverend Dr. Matt Russell and the Reverend Dr. Cleve Tinsley from Project Curate. Project Curate is a nonprofit social impact agency and consultancy that works with religious, academic, and community organizations to address and support collaborative responses to intersectional issues relating to racial justice and inequality. They do so through curriculum development, training, and design, con consulting and facilitation, research, community building and organizing, public events, and various multimedia interventions. Effective methods for community and civic engagement must be rooted in a vibrant and authentic community where creative and innovative strategies are encouraged and fostered. They seek to sustain and in some cases reconstitute bold and prophetic movements for social change with this conviction. Visit www.projectcurate.org or email info at projectcurate.org for more information. The Reverend Dr. Cleve Tinsley IV is a scholar of religion and black studies. He earned his MA and PhD in religion from Rice University, where he concentrated in the study of African American religions. His research employs inter- and anti-disciplinary theoretical and methodological approaches and efforts that explore the nature and meaning of Black religious struggle and identity in light of the ever-evolving social complexities that shape religious formations and spirituality in the life of African Americans today. He's a visiting research fellow in the Religion and Public Life program at Rice University, a committed community activist, organizer, an ordained and often transgressive Baptist minister who holds Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. He has extensive experience as an organizer, institution builder, manager, and consultant for churches, community organizations, and educational nonprofit organizations across the country. The Reverend Dr. Matthew Russell is currently on staff at Chapelwood United Methodist Church, is co-founder of Iconoclast Artists, and is assistant professor of recovery ministry at Fuller Theological Seminary. Prior to this, he was on faculty at Duke Divinity School as professor of theology and community development. In 2013, he completed a two-year postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Cambridge in their psychology and religion research group, where he explored redemptive narratives and models of the church's ministry of reconciliation in urban settings. While there, he was a tutor at Cambridge Theological Federation and on staff at St. Edward's King and Martyr Congregation. He received his Master of Divinity from Fuller Theological Seminary and, created, uh, and completed his PhD at Texas Tech University in 2010. The Dialogue Project is an initiative of Interfaith Ministries for Greater Houston, Houston's oldest interfaith service organization with dialogue, collaboration, and service, and the strength of shared beliefs as our mission. We carry our work out through four core programs 
Meals on Wheels, Refugee Services, Volunteer Houston, and Interfaith Relations and Community Partnerships. To learn more about our interfaith engagement work, email us today at ircp at imgh.org, and please support us at imgh.org slash donate slash ircp. I'm the Reverend Gregory Hahn. I'm the Director of Interfaith Relations and Education, and I will be your host today. And that kind of concludes the opening foray, and we'll get right into the conversation with Matt and Cleve. Um, Cleve, let me start with you, um, and or again, the, the both of you. I'm wondering if the first question can be, can you tell us just a little bit more about Project Curate and how it came to be? Sure, I, I think, um... More appropriately, and probably should start with Matt. I can talk about how we sort of have transitioned. Uh, but Matthew Russell really was a brainchild of what's called Project Curate, at least in name and its earlier instantiation as it relates to prison pipeline, a lot of issues with immigration, but also a key tie to how we've come together. So I'll yield to him, but I want to, he has an important part as it relates to the conversations about theology and tackling issues of inequality. I think is important before I come in and talk more about it. Yeah, um, first of all, I just want to say what an honor it is to be here with, with you and um, uh, Greg and just in, in this conversation, uh, both with you and with Cleve, it's, uh, it's a joy. So we find it to be a deep pleasure and honor to be here. Um, Thanks, welcome. Um, so Project Curate really um, emerged out of an impetus for um, how, as Houston uh, was get, is, is getting larger and larger, um, how do we create bridges across divides? And so um, when I returned um, to Houston, I had been in Houston for a long time as a, as a pastor left, did my PhD, came back, not, not thinking I was gonna be coming back to Houston, but came back to Houston. And um, in, in the midst of that, was getting to know some folks at Rice University at the time, particularly some folks that were working on the Kinder uh, report, the area report. And uh, one of the things that they had begun to discuss internally was the fact that as Houston got larger, um, one of the issues that was happening is that they were going to have to figure out how to bridge divides across gaps, uh, across these kind of divisions. And I felt like, one, as a local pastor, that was really a particular call of the church um, um, as it moves towards the world in love, that it bridges divides. Um, and so Curate kind of came out of that impetus at the beginning. There was a, uh, there was a lot of things happening with immigration, migration, and um, unaccompanied minors, and all those things that we got involved with. And we began to... Uh, really kind of collect and begin to um, be in relationship with a very diverse group of, uh, of uh, churches across the city. And in that place, began to do kind of some co-curriculum. What would it look like if we came together from across the city and began to both understand each other's neighborhoods, understand uh, the histories behind those neighborhoods, what divided us, and there's ways that we might collaborate out of that. We did that for two or three years before I met Cleve and um, that both that work got blown up and got deeper uh, all in the same move. Uh, but uh, in parallel, Cleve and some of the things that he was uh, involved in were running parallel, although we did not meet each other until, um, um, until a, an event happened within um, the city um, that necessitated that. But I'll yield to, to Cleve and let him talk about some of that as well. Super, thanks, Matt. Yeah. So, so yeah, I think, uh, what, Matt, what that leads up to is really July of 2016. So four years ago, really July 16, 2016, uh, churches across the city of Houston specifically, but really across the nation, really began to become stirred by Philando Castile, Alton Sterling, Dallas police officers, right? There was, uh, again, uprisings or less and concerns about racial justice in this country. And there was this need, especially among religious communities, to say there's a need for us to come together and do something differently. Here's where Matt uh, really, I, I think, yielded to something larger than him, right? I think uh, he was attuned to that, that moment as a spiritual moment and said, uh, we need to do something differently. Yes, uh, I think we've been doing some good things in this city, uh, but we have seemed to miss this and we need to make more room to make this happen. Now, as Matt said, uh, for about two years, we've been working parallel to each other in the city. I was involved and uh, the movement for Black Lives in Houston, Texas. I was leveraging my uh, relationship with uh, Rice University to sponsor certain symposiums about uh, Black social life and 
how to bring together activists and artists and scholars together to talk about uh, the nature and meaning of Black life in the United States. And when Alton Sterling came around, uh, I also was um, a participant and a member of the United Methodist Church in Houston as well. Matt's a minister in that, in that city. And it came about, they wanted to do this vigil in the city. Uh, and that was interesting about it. I had uh, really not engaged theologically for about four or five years before that. I was really concerned with my own studies. But at this vigil, Matt was a part of the organizing team and he said, you know what, we need to sit down and listen this time. And some kind of way, uh, I was invited to kind of uh, be an introductory speaker in that series through my relationship with other ministers of the United Veterans. So that night happened. And then from there, Matt said, hey, um, listen, I've been thinking about where to go next. Would you be interested in helping me think together? And we both really just went out and uh, spent some time together one afternoon and thought about the possibilities and also the perils of that happening, what kind of risks would be involved for both of us to do that, and what outcome we really wanted. And from there, uh, we kind of started making a transition. We both were open to, both I think willing to uh, be more palliable there and say, hey, it's gonna require some adjustments on my part for me. Uh, I'm gonna have to be willing to engage theoretically more robustly with theological language, right? And he was like, hey, I'm going to have to be willing to deconstruct some of the things that inhabit uh, what I feel uh, religious ideologies kind of been like hampered in certain ways. So that's how we kind of began starting this project and it kind of evolved from there in 2016. And since then, we've just gone through a whole bunch of changes since. I've been active and or and interested and watch what project curate for the last couple of years and you know, one of the interesting things and one of the reasons I wanted to have you as, as dialogue partners is what you're kind of describing is very much an interior journey as much as an exterior journey as well that those those things are together and you and and, and here we are and with our, our our summer series and vital conversations with our community coming in the wake of the death of George Floyd with that large kind of with with the three amigos and now this the second episode um, and again one of the things that was brought up is this notion of allyship and I wanted to spend some time uh, with with y'all trying to unpack that word a little bit so the idea of allies has been talked about more and more it's probably been talked about for for many years but really I think through uh, after after the death of George Floyd has even more entered into the public consciousness at, at a different level um, to you, what does that word mean to be an ally? And what would you say are the strengths and the weaknesses of that word right now as we talk about allyship? Yeah, so I, I yield to Matt to start about how he thinks about it. I'm happy to talk about some of the weaknesses and possibilities of it. Yeah, so um, I think first of all, being, uh, and uh, I'll give a definition of at least my understanding of that, and then kind of we can we can talk about some of the issues that I have with that as well. But I think being an ally first begins with the recognition that there's a problem of racism, um, particularly not exclusively though the problem of anti-black racism. Um, and um, so to be a, a white ally, recognize the problem, uh, educates um, oneself um, in the white community about that problem, denounces the problem in all of its manifestations, is committed to be a part of the solution and uh, ridding um, 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 the, the, the culture, the nation, the community of racism and anti-black racism in, in particular. Um, now I have some, some issues around that, but that's how I would kind of get into that and, and define, um, uh, define the, the work. I think I think the term has um, both I think um, effective possibilities and also meanings, but also like I, I want to acknowledge certain traditions of critique of the term as well. So on the one hand, I think an ally, if we were to use these maritime analogies, refers to one who's really to, willing to kind of uh, get in the, the war with someone, right? Willing to lose their lives side by side for a cause that may, they may not have necessarily initiated, right? Um, and the struggle for racial justice and inequality, issues of uh, immigration, uh, and ally is someone typically from, uh, from a larger power group that decides to join alongside others uh, in their struggle against that, right? Now, I raise issues of critique because I don't think there's one way to think about it. I think, you know, the strong criticism side is also not necessarily always helpful, but I think uh, 
the black feminist and also uh, black radical critique against this. The critique is about why are we using this term black allies when these, these are things especially uh, that black women and black queer folks have been uh, doing uh, for centuries and for ages and we have, we have to like have ascribe them this term ally now right so there's a way in which the term ally can be taken on as some kind of badge of honor yeah. uh, especially by, from folks in power uh, but I also think it's, it's a still a helpful way to think through some things now um, radical freedom movement means preferred terms like comrades or co-conspirators co those who are yep. willing to do things like that but I, do, I still don't think, you know, we need to throw away the term. I just think there needs to be more healthy conversation around what the implications are that time, that term are for folks. A lot of folks use the term ally as a way to get getting some kind of cultural cachet from it. Uh, and so there's a difference between the term and those who try to thickly live into what that might mean. Really, allyship means being willing to suffer loss for a cause, cause that may not be your own, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I think about the term uh, a bit about it a bit more. It also, I think, it relates to the the process of decentering one's self within power to to stand in a place of social transformation, where that so that that transformation um, um, can be possible. It's it's a there's almost a prophetic summonsing to uh, to to that space, and we can, uh, as Cleve said, I think. It, I think that's right on. There's, we can talk about the language and parse those words, but the, there's an event that happens in the name of those words that we're trying to get at uh, that would yeah. say that it's important to move towards that, uh, that space of decentering one's self, particularly um, um, in, in positions of power to, to, um, to be converted by a social transformation, a, a social imagination that is rooted in, a, in an alternative way of, of being in the world, of, of our social relationships ordered differently in the world. I think that's what stands at the, at the, um, at the center of that. Yeah. Matt, could you say just a little more, again, one of the, the reasons that I, I wanted to, to start with a conversation with, with, with y'all is this, this, this deep kind of theological conviction as well, and, and, and words such as transformation. And could, could you say a little bit more about how you're using the term decentered? Because that's a, I think that's a really, really important concept in our often, I would argue, narcissistic, even solipsistic world in which we live. Yeah, sure. You know, Cleveland and I've talked about a, a lot about this uh, together, and it's been really helpful to, first of all, um, to be in a um, um, in a in in a set of conversations over the last four years with uh, both Cleveland and the community that we're a part of. And really, where I understand decentering to come from in my own tradition um, is this uh, this this word kenosis, this word of of self giving, of giving up. There's a sense in which we are captivated by uh, different ideas of power, which really, I think, in the end of the day, are um, our security systems and they are controlled systems. And we see within uh, the Christian tradition, this other move from domination, these domination um, systems to amicus systems where there is uh, um, much more, um, uh, it's, it's, uh, relationships are, are much more centered. And so power from a white perspective or from a centering perspective is given up for an imagination of a world that is different, um, is transformed, is um, held differently within its, uh, within its construction of relationship. And I think we see that all the way throughout in the life of, of Jesus. And then I think Paul picks that up and begins to deconstruct this kind of understanding of power all the way through. So the decentering for me really is a, a theological paradigm that centers within really the person of, of Jesus and this kenosis is giving up a power for something um, for a different world that's based in religion or based in relationship rather and this uh, this movement I see in the New Testament where he says no longer do you call me Lord but you call me friends this movement away from that that alters everything this this uh, but we're still deeply invested in domination systems and I think that's why the decentering is such a um, um, an important move that for me really is one of a, a, a process of discipleship and a deeply spiritual move at the center of it. Thank you. And again, I appreciate the time, I think, talking about words. Um, mm -hmm. the, the words that we, that we use 
are just so important. And I think in this, this whole time of social unrest, and I think at least the way I see it, more and more people willing to be involved in larger movements fighting racism, I think there's also this incredible need to understand more of the history and also to be very careful of the, of the, of the language that, that we use. Um, the other thing that, that, that you, you bring up is, is this, this notion of transformation and this notion of multi-layeredness as well that, um, that there's a lot that as well that's going on beyond um, a protest or a march uh, that is part of this, I think the social transformation that you all have been, that, that have been talking about. Um, what do you see as the impediments to allyship when it comes to fighting racism in your, in your experience over you know, your years of ministry, but particularly over the last four years? I mean, I think for me, um, impediments to being out, I think there is always, again, there is, I think it's important that we're talking about um, the importance of doing one's homework as it relates to language, but also how to um, really orient oneself to any role that they take on, right? So really these terms ally is not something that we've been grappling and struggling with the last four years, but we ourselves have had to think about what that means for us to be an ally, not just Matt being a white man, an ally with a black man, but what does it mean for us, right, that uh, who exists in a, um, a kind of um, what you'd call um, male kind of like uh, heterodominance, what does it mean for us to kind of then think about our own way that we are in allies uh, with women, with queer communities, with other communities of color, with all marginalized black, indigenous, and poor folk? Uh, what does that mean for us for how we try to also engage in a kind of religious leadership? What does it mean for us to decenter ourselves as it relates to that? So if folks have, uh, who've been with us and journey with us last four years might see that, hey, Matt was doing this, joined with Cleve, so it was a Cleve and Matt doing some things, and then it kind of stretched even further, and we had to further kind of decenter ourselves and our own leadership model and say, uh, we gotta act, make sure that we, have other representation of those who are leading and we can't claim to be allies, right? For say, um, our partners who are, are from other communities as well. If we're not trying to also do the self-critical work of allyship uh, to make sure it's at point on us. A lot of times folks use the term ally uh, as a way of gaining cultural cachet to do yeah. some other things, other self-interest. And we just think that term its impediments are also some of the ways that it can, it can, I think, make you grow. In other words, if we, if you understand yourself properly as an ally, you also perceive that to be a call uh, for you to grow and change and transform, to really do this, you know, Christ hymn of, you know, Philippians chapter two, right? And empty mm -hmm. oneself into a way of becoming that allows you to really be effective in the struggle for social change. And I think an ally also has to one of the impediments of allies, allyship is those who might self-describe themselves as allies might fall into the trap of thinking that they got it all together, right? Uh, I, for one, have never uh, identified myself as being an ally with any, com any, with any community. I would rather receive an invitation for them to kind of join me at work, yeah. and I am what they call me. But for me to take on that title, I think sometimes it's just another way of kind of engaging in this work in a more humility stance of humility that allows yeah. us to kind of be, be a lot better. That's very really good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Matt, do, do, do you have a, do you want to add anything to that? Or? I, I would just, um, you know, I would just maybe, uh, I think that's, that's right. I, I think uh, labeling oneself as an ally um, sometimes can be a bit problematic with, particularly with the community. I think it's the community that you're, um, that, that in some ways you're adopted by that gets to name you. Um, and so there's a naming that happens in that that I think that's important that you don't name yourself, but you, you the way you move, the way you comport yourself within the work and in the relationships, the way that that happens is uh, there's a naming process that I think is really important. I think some of the impediments to allyship, sometimes there can be a fickleness about the work and that um, often um, in times like there, these, there can be this kind of great awakening, but then the way that whiteness often works or the way that power often works 
works. It's a, that um, it will it will say how long do I have to hold myself this way before I can go back to normal, you know. And so there's a there's a fickleness in this. And so I think that that the kind of um, allyship, the way we're using that word, at least Cleve and I are now, has got to be rooted in an alternative word or maybe a companion word called solidarity. And I think it's got to be the movement from these performative kind of um, works uh, to this often quieter, deeper, behind the scenes, um, um, giving oneself to the work for decades. Um, I think that's really important. Um, often allies uh, focus on the interpersonal. And so there's a real need for friendship within that work. And uh, often that's just another way of centering whiteness in a way that you're acting like you're decentering it. Yeah. Um, and so I think that what solidarity does within that movement is, is deeply committed to dismantling structures um, um, within, uh, within, within racism and within yeah. inequity. So. I, 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 I think for me, one of the things I'm hearing is that one of the deep concerns is this kind of work in anti-racism and allyship is open very much to self-deception of, of thinking you're doing good work when you're really doing something that I think you're comfortable with. And so uh, I think that notion of humility as well as um, a vulnerability, I think, is another word that, that would come to mind. I think the other thing that you bring up is this notion of community, that this is done something, th th an identity that is bestowed upon you by a community, which is a little antithetical sometimes to the individualism that we have mm. been taught over the over over the decades, if not the centuries, of of understanding our identity coming out of community, kind of the you know because because we are I am instead of the because I am um, th th that th that I help to bring about. The, I guess the other concerns that you that you bring up, um, uh, especially in this day and age, uh, is watching and the the concerns about the commodification and the domestic the domestic the domestic the domesticity of anti-racism work. Um, I'm, I'm sure you have as well as many people who are watching getting emails from um, different corporations saying Corporation X stands with Black Lives Matter, Corporation Y stands against racism, as if they're trying to again um, this cachet or commodifying what often I would think is 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 difficult work. Um, I've, do you, is there anything in that kind of rambling that you want to pick up on at all before I go to the next next question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I have some thoughts about it. On the one hand, I think it's, it's positive that, uh, at least not in my lifetime, I've never seen as many uh, persons and or, or, or their organizations recognize that there is a need to do something right. differently. And so even if folks are falling, they're falling forward, as my friend Matt would often say, right? Like, so my thing is like, there's nothing you can do right anyway if, if you're trying to be an ally. You're gonna, part of being an ally or being someone who wants to see substantive change mean, means not being a, afraid of messing up, right? So any corporation that makes a statement, uh, they just need to know they're gonna be subject to criticism because what persons from communities who have been suffering uh, all this time are looking for is the follow up to the statement, right? We, we're, we appreciate the elegant words, but what persons are really looking to now is what substantive changes are you willing to make uh, as it relates to that. We at Project Curate, for instance, have received numerous inquiries and many consulted opportunities around this moment after George Floyd. And what we say to folks who contact us is quite simple. Listen, uh, we're happy you contacted and we're happy to engage uh, you in conversation. What you need to decide before we go forward is at what level are you willing to go, right? Are you trying to say you're trying to address some yeah. issues internally to begin having some conversations? Or are you really trying to do some kind of policy changes to the way that you're comprised as a, as a group? What you offer in programming? All of these are different kinds of questions. And from my perspective, I'm like, I'm okay if you're okay with just acknowledging where you are and how far you're willing to go. Because if you're willing to go all the way sometimes, that may mean in the long run, not right now while it's hot, right? It's, it's okay. It's, yep. it's great right now to say Black Lives Matter. I mean, it's okay for everybody to say that now. But a couple of months from now, that may fade. And Matthew and I have been around where that has happened. 2016, it was really popular for folks to be about racial justice. 
2018, 2020 or so, mm -hmm. it wasn't so. so we, we lost <laughs> a lot of money. We lost a lot of opportunities, lost some friends, all kind of stuff, right? Now it's hot again. Everybody loves us again for a little minute, right? Um, so the question becomes, how far are you willing to take it? It's okay. I mean, release your statement, but then be willing to stand up to the criticism to, to be held to the fire for following up for that. That's, that's the only thing I would say is yeah. a follow up to whatever you want to say about it. Yeah. Right, thanks. And, and I would, I would just, you know, I actually absolutely agree. I would also say if, if black lives matter, then, um, then, then they need to matter at the top of the organizational structure. And so it just doesn't matter. It, we're, we're not after this. The movement is just not after let, let's kill less people. It's, it's a restructuring of our social relationships as it relates to power and access to that, um, to, to equity and to fair housing and education and opportunity and food. All of these things are at the bottom of this. So the movement um, for black liberation is tied up in the movement for really um, the liberative movement of all of us that I would say is uh, within my own kind of Christian tradition is that the, the, the heart of this uh, brown um, um, Jewish liberator that um, wasn't just handing out Big Macs but was talking about uh, the oppressive power of the empire. And so at some, at some form, at some level, this uh, being able to say Black Lives Matter is a creed in a sense, um, um, in the same creed that if, if Jesus is Lord, then Caesar can't be Lord. And so there's a creed that is bound up in this that says there's an alternative power structure that must be um, opened up to the world. And I, and I would want to root that in my own Christian tradition as a, yeah. in, the, in the person of Christ. That's a good, that's a good um, segue into kind of the next set of questions. Again, the, the reason that I always value our conversations are that you're, you know, you're community oriented, you're, 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 you're theologians and pastors as well. So I know that the three of us as pastors come primarily out of a Christian context, but, you're, but, you're, but your view is much more capacious than yeah. just Christianity, both as, as theologians, but also as, as scholars. So thinking more about religion in general, and I'll ask both of these questions because I guess they can be looked at as two sides of the, of the coin. What is the role of religion or belief in fighting racism? And in your experience, where does religion get in the way of effective anti-racist work? Yeah, those are, those are great questions. And I, and, uh, I think it's helpful to, to think about it too. I mean, I think, um, as a, so as a pragmatist thinker, I, I always say religion is what it does, right? It's different than sort of faith and faith community, but uh, essentially a religion uh, at bottom just refers to the ties that bind, right? What is it that binds us as a community? What shared solidarities and commitments we have? And then how do we objectify those commitments, create some ritual behaviors around them, some narratives that shape us and all that kind of stuff. Here I'm speaking sociologically, right? Right, uh, exactly. About what it means, right? Now, uh, we can have further conversation. So religion then, sociologically speaking, has some uh, problems, right? Whenever one begins to kind of, uh, have to address problems that lie outside of what that uh, community might be comfortable thinking about. It has what I call both a sinister and sincere side to it. The sincere side of religion is this, right? It's about creating common bonds and unity. Uh, the sinister side of it tries to, and the dangerous side of religion is that because it's so deeply held within these myths and narratives and traditions that are deeply personal to us, right? We, we fail oftentimes to disentangle our allegiances uh, from, the, from, the, from the power arrangement that deeply kind of like um, make these things a bit sorted, right? So in a sense, right, we want to unify and universalize everything, right? And so especially for those of us in Abrahamic or Christian traditions or whatever, we have a set, a set of core tenets that we like to subscribe to, certain rituals that we have that we say, we're all in this family together, this happens. So what ends up happening to have more narrow conversations about issues of racial inequality, sexual inequality, all this kind of stuff, it's harder for us to do that. Why? Because we like to just quote from a meta narrative and say, no, the real issue is we just not, not right with our God or right with our tradition. If we can do that, we don't have to worry about this other stuff. What that fails to recognize, however, is that all of our universal arrangements, uh, regardless or not, because they're human institutions, they benefit some people the most, right? Mm -hmm. There are always some folk at the type of our hierarchies, no matter how sincere we try to be, we have to engage in a constant work of saying, 
In what ways then is our religion as it has been constructed really done so in a way that benefits some over and against others? And left we're willing to constantly do this uh, self-critical work of saying, you know what, historically we've moved in this way, but you know, there are some ways that we can learn from how different movements are happening. And uh, what, what Matt and I and our colleagues have recognized is that there are pretty much just two gaps that we, we, we tend to fill. We have rich traditions where we're able to do what, convene folks together like we're doing now. Uh, we've been given this uh, liberty as it relates to cultural authority. Folks want to listen to what we want to say. But where we often fail as religious leaders is we don't go a step further and learn from what movements are happening and learn how to uh, create newer tactics and strategies that don't that are not necessarily outside of our tradition. They've always existed. We just not have always listened to how to uh, better manipulate those for the times that are present right now. We've been so busy of trying to lay stakes to our own authority that we haven't been able to go back to our conversation about allyship, move ourselves out of the way, right? How do we create room and then grow? Because the truth of the matter is, the more room we create for others, it challenges me to become more mature, to develop more as a leader, because I have to be stretched. I also grow when I place uh, my authority in amidst the authority of others and figure out how to make that work and be best for everybody else. Wow. Matt, um, gosh, there's a lot there. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, it's why I often, often quote my preaching professor, Peter Gomes, who said, again, um, a, a surplus of virtue is more dangerous than a surplus of vice because yeah. virtue is not constrained by the bounds of conscience. And it's the other reason I tell people I study religion because at a certain level, I trust all of y'all. I study religion because I don't trust any of y'all. <laughs> because of both those sincere and sinister sides of, of religion. Um, again, it's kind of uh, to, to, to pick up on that, again, at least what you've seen as both the, the, the how religion, the religious impulse is both can, can, can further and also hinder um, anti-racist work. Yeah, I think in the, I mean, when I think just uh, of the, the, the etymology of religion is to bind, to connect, yeah. to, it's, it's a ligament, right? And so in some ways when religion is, is acting within its own um, um, life force of impetus, there's this, this desire for these things that have been uh, fractured um, to, be, uh, to be bound, to be healed, to be connected, right? And so um, um, partly the way that religion should be moving is to is to provide um, a prophetic utterance to that type of vision of the future together. When religion becomes um, a force, as is. Um, um, as Cleve was saying, the sinister side of that, where it's it's really about an institutional empowered or embodied empowerment of a particular um, um, group of people, it um, it as we you know don't have to go back too far in history to say it just it creates um, it, it creates a genocide. You know, and we're, we're, we're living in that type of um, religion gone bad, in a sense, in the wake of that, uh, within what we're experiencing, I believe, right now, uh, the justifications of slavery, the justification of um, um, goods and services held in the hands of a few, why there's uh, many that suffer and poor. Uh, and so I think there's a call to uh, that, that, um, that, that a new imagination that might be birthed out of religion that we have to be faithful to. Um, if we're going to uh, to move forward in this, yeah. and if I may, I think that's the that's the um, I think that's the side that oftentimes doesn't get talked about. We often run into, and those of us on this call, especially interested, uh, in this thing that often gets overlooked, which is the hopeful side of religion or the religious mm -hmm. imagination. Yeah. Side, as I say it. Yeah. Uh, the truth of the matter is, the sincere and great thing about all of our traditions is the ability it has to inspire hope and bravery and patience across time and trials with all this stuff. I mean, I think about a great religious thinker like William James who said it really does seem like there's something wild in the universe we're at work at and we all have to, whether we have our atheisms or whatever, stuff is beautiful, right? So like there are ways of, <laughs> yeah. uh, if we look at our narratives, we look at all of our myths, we look at the stuff is not only beautiful, but inspires hope. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. I think our communities, uh, we shouldn't let go of that. We shouldn't also, Absolutely allow our community to be critiqued so much that we don't say, now hold on a minute, that, it ain't all bad. I mean, we've done some good in history, right? Yeah, we're <laughs> impediment, we're tied up with colonialism, Euro-Christianity, you got some stuff going on with it, but think about the creative 
side of the religious imagination, right? The way in which not only we inspire people, the way that we still continue to convene folk, the way in which at bottom, just like you were saying, uh, Reverend Hahn, is like there are, there, are, there are aspects of the religious consciousness that's not subject to the humanities and social sciences, right? Uh, there's a way of moving, of being part of a larger cultural zeitgeist that can't be always accounted for neatly and just simply our secular humanist kind of movements, right? And so I think all these things can meld together is the reason why like, I still remain hopeful as a cleric, so to speak, as well as a critical theorist who thinks about these things. Because the truth of the matter is, uh, the great thing about the religious consciousness is that Matt and I are friends. We're not just allies in this work together, but mm. there's something more meaningful and deep for us at least that makes this work worth the strenuous effort that we try to, yes. try to yeah. Yeah. And that's a good way, um, again, another good segue into the next set of questions as we've been you know, talking uh, very importantly about some of the theoretical, but as I think someone that said, there's nothing more practical than a good theory. Um, into just some of your experiences, and I'm seeing some of the questions coming through. How do we break down barriers of race and class to build a people-centered movement for for lasting transformation? What do you What do you all recommend to help educate people about this important message? Um, what have you found to be effective? What have you in your experiences? What have you been found to be effective ways to be an ally in in in, in fighting racism? You know, I would say um, the root of that goes back to some of the things we were talking about earlier in, in that um, um, for me, and I could only tell, you know, my, my story, and I'm sure that there's a thousand different ways of, of this kind of working itself out with really um, um, beauty and, um, and strength, is that um, being, being grafted into um, work within the city of work I was already doing when I met Cleve, it broadened it and it deepened it. Um, because at some level, um, because of um, where I was, uh, the, the framework in which I was born in, uh, really my paradigm uh, could only see in, in terms of the, like the Jahari window. There were things that I could not see until I was brought into relationship with uh, a, another community. So I was working deeply within the immigrant community, uh, mainly uh, Latinx community, deeply within uh, prison uh, uh, reform and prison um, um, systems. Uh, and when I was brought into relationship, and all those dynamics were there, um, but I was still operating out of more a paradigm of, um, I would say, reconciliation rather than solidarity, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a movement that I was still having that was moving towards kind of more service rather than justice, uh, where I was, I was um, still invested in being a really good white person that was doing really good work. Um, and um, there is, in a sense, a giving up of in, in the movement um, being grafted in with this, 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 this constructive work that Cleve and I are part of now, I think is important to do both deconstructive and then constructive work that we've moved into now. There is, um, there's a sense in which coalition building and those relationships are now all bound up together. It, the movement and the work is slow. It's, it's um, because it's non-hierarchical. There is, you attend to these relationships in particular ways that are very important. And because of that, the work is, is, is slow. There is uh, an honesty that is a part of that and an accountability that is a mutual, really an exquisite mutuality that's a part of that. Um, that I would I would suggest, um, and I, and I would found that within those collaborations, those kind of collaborative work together is where I'm finding there to be a lot of juice for me, um, mm -hmm. because one I'm not alone. I'm grafted into a new set of histories that I'm learning, and and it's uh, confronting my own worldview constantly. Yeah. Do you? Let me, let me ask another kind of practical or, or maybe more practically oriented question as well. What, like, if, let's say a church, that's just as an example, comes to you, and this has probably happened, saying, we want as a community to be involved in anti-racist work. Um, what, what, are church, what can churches do? Maybe that we can spend some time on sort of the what, what can be done, recognizing a lot of the conversation has been about a re relationship and, and transformation and solidarity. Um, but what can what can communities do to to join into the work of of anti racism? 
But I, th I think there are, you know, there, there are multiple ways to, to do it. I mean, I mean, it, first it depends on the church that's asking, right? Yep. Socioeconomic questions come into bear. Am I talking about a middle brow white church in the middle of the suburbs? Am I talking about uh, a black or Latinx church uh, in an urban area? There are various ways that church who wants to be committed to uh, work of inequality and against injustice can, can participate. So for instance, uh, uh, like you said at the beginning, I, in addition to uh, thinking about these issues, I also am a practitioner. It's part of a church now that's uh, trying to do the work not only of convening, right, but doing the work of community building and organizing, really, really. And that what we find is that when it comes to organizing uh, for the sake of supporting and advocating for uh, more vulnerable communities, a lot of churches don't know where to begin with that unless they're already one of those churches in those communities, right? Yeah. So one of the things that we're, we're trying to do is uh, those who are self-selecting from our religious community who are interested in this kind of work, uh, we teach them how to dwell with, right? To be that embodiment uh, where it's not about proselytizing, it's not about uh, kind of got you in the end. It's just really about learning about that community and kind of being it. That requires that you establish some relationships of trust uh, with these communities. Yes. But then more than that, there are specific missions that you can have coming out of your church that explicitly is about organizing around these justice issues. It requires that you build transformational leadership uh, to do that. And so there are several ways. Matt and I do it as practitioners. Now Matt at his church, for instance, they're doing a bunch of programs around these issues where he just happens to be there. He can help them do that. There are ways that Matt and I both as practitioners are involved in local context to make that work work. But our work through Project Curate tries to, to fill another gap. So for instance, you may not have either the capacity or the time as a pastor, or uh, maybe the support in your congregation to really do a large program around it. Uh, but there are organizations like Lily, Lily Foundation, Louisville, who allows us to create a structure that folks can join a program where we can kind of begin to talk about these issues and help them develop strategies to really be involved. Again, this is explicitly with racial justice and inequality work, right? So you have to be, if you're concerned about issues of inclusion and equity and racial justice, that's a particular kind of work and prophetic calling that's different. And you got to recognize that uh, every church may not be called to that work, right? And so, and I think that's okay. Uh, there are ways that you still can participate. A lot of people, churches do social outreach, but the work of struggling for racial justice, the work of struggling uh, against issues of inequity and justice is a particular bent. Oftentimes, uh, depending on the charismatic figure who's the leader or the pastor or the institutional authority behind that. But there are a, a variety of ways that folks can get in in large or small ways. There's no one way to tackle it. Uh, but if you're interested, if folks are interested, uh, I think there's uh, a, a bunch of creative ways to kind of get involved. Okay, super. Other, Matt, any other kind of best practices? Again, um, what, what I'm hearing is that there are best practices, but a lot of those come out of the context of trust and community building, and you've got to be in relationship. I'm wondering, though, if, again, thinking about best practices, at least in your experience for anti-racist work, um, mm. what, what, are, are there some that seem to keep emerging um, that you want to build that, that Cleve has mentioned? You know, one of the things that I, I particularly the time that we're in right now, and I can speak to kind of my own context of, of being involved in kind of white communities and a white church is that it's really important for the white church to do its own work for a lot of, in a lot of ways, the, the, the um, time that we're in is incumbent upon um, um, white folks to deconstruct this world that we have not um, had to that we have been able to live within. And the question is, is how far do, um, are we committed to the work of transformation and the mutual flourishing of all people? And so um, I would say that, that because of that, there's an educational, um, there's kind of an education kind of uh, arc that, that the, the, 
the the why folks need to go on and I, I you know I'm glad to be able to get on Amazon and have a bunch of books sold out right now because it seems like people are doing that work you know and um, educating themselves I think a lot of times what will end up happening is the white um, white folks will come to their black colleagues and ask them to educate them you know and um, that it's deeply problematic where yeah. I think this is the work that the that the white folks in terms of allies and using that word need to turn towards each other keep each other accountable do that work together and then move forward in that work and so that's one of the uh, the best practices um, let me take a, a couple of questions I have two kind of closing aspirational questions to, to, to uh, as, as we come into near three o'clock um, it's a hard question because I used to think of, I, of myself not so long ago as a young person but I guess I'm not how, how what do you recommend to help educate young people about this important message of anti-racist, you know, of anti-racism work? When you're thinking of that quote unquote next generation, I don't even know if that's the right way to think about, uh, to, 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 to talk about it, but, um, but, that, but there is a, a, a coming generation of, of, of young people in the, their 20s or in college or teenagers um, thinking about when they take on that, that next mantle of uh, authority, um, uh, and which they can have right now in so many ways, of course. Um, what, is, what is your message to young people? Yeah, I'm not sure if I have a particular message for young people. I think for me, uh, I'm learning a lot from them. As, as a yeah. They're at the front lines of this stuff right now. I think Matt and I, if we're honest, we can explicitly say we, uh, we're Gen Xers, right? So we're, yeah. we, we learned a lot from the previous generation of millennials. And what you see now on the front lines, Gen Zers on the line really taking these steps further, what we can learn from them. So there are two things I think. For one, we, what we can learn from them are the tactics and strategies that are necessary for now, right? Uh, the millennials and Gen Zers who, who are out there leading these movements now have done something quite effective in the age of social media, especially uh, with more yeah. coverage. That they've done is they've created a, a more level playing field. Yeah. No longer can one religious cleric stand up and speak for everybody, right? Folks can now, disagree with you and now challenge your authority in, in ways that they couldn't prior to, right? And so things about, you know, being not hierarchical, things about collaboration, things about consensus building, we're learning all this stuff now from the younger generation leaders. Now, what I think younger, uh, younger folks can learn from us and generations who are older than us, uh, as it relates to kind of institution building and some organizing strategy, what it means to do that, right? Because how to sustain movements, for instance, uh, what we see oftentimes in, in young groups, they have the passion, the energy, and the, the, and the capacity. Some of the most gifted folks I've met and I learned from are from Gen Z and, and millennials, uh, where I can see like some areas for improvement and is like how to sustain these things over time, right? Not to just pop up for a year or so here or six months or so here, but then not, not continue. Madden I's work has been figuring out models and ways to sustain that work and part of that admittedly comes from being caught up in a larger neoliberal capitalistic structure where Matt and I have had experiences learning how to do that, right? And so uh, that's the aspect I think we can both learn from each other on is how to then make our organizing work be more sustaining, right? And I think uh, those where younger folks can learn from a whole range of activists and leaders out there like uh, the three religious figures you had on before us in your last talk. But I also think we could be opening to learning together with the young folk on what's needed at this time for us to really be. Yeah, super. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. a little, oh, sorry. Lift a name, uh, Adrian Marie Brown, for instance, yeah. is uh, really a, a young activist or millennial activist now that a lot of us have learned from Emergent Strategy, yeah. uh, a book that she has out now that persons are really doing amazing work. But she's not the only one. There are folk who are in Chicago, leaders and activists who are doing amazing work right now. So it sounds like that we need to be in very put in a position of, of learning of not of no of, in a, not saying that we have all the answers. Um, but what not letting that paralyze us from right. moving forward or Matt to use your term that that Cleve used a falling forward as well. Mm -hmm. um, term I would use is like mutual exchange, right? We got to place ourselves in uh, social spaces that allow there for to be uh, 
mutual exchange. And that has been the problem, I think, for those of us who are clerics and part of religious institutions. We want to control the terms. We also yes. want to control the kind of exchange we happen. And so, yeah, we want to have a conversation with folks who are out there doing radical work. We need to engage in this kind of, nobody would disagree with that. But the terms on which we do that, we would disagree with. No, I'm not willing to uh, speak outside of my own language community or to go to a different space or go to them to do this. I want them to do it on my terms, but you gotta create, and that's all the work we do around our curricula and cohort building and project curate is all about that. It's about uh, loosening some of those strangles on being able to kind of create mutual exchange from different communities. Um, there's a, I, I wanna throw this question out here. I don't know if we, it, it's such a big one, but uh, maybe we could pick this up in another conversation. Often when we start talking about anti-racism work in the church or in faith communities, it gets quickly labeled as political. Um, and how do we, how do we re, you know, resist that using the language of the church or the language of theology? I don't know if you've got a quick couple of minute kind of riff on, on that mm -hmm. or your own experiences with, oh, we don't talk about that. We're separation of church and politics or um, that's, gonna, that's going to be too controversial. Um, is, how, how can this be a, 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 a theological, in some ways, a theological conversation a, a, a more than a political conversation, or maybe the real quest answer is why are people seeing those as two different things? <laughs> yeah, I, I would just say that um, within my, my own experience is that um, um, there, there's a tendency right now to, in some ways, reduce things down to, uh, to, to a nub. And I think that there is a pushback against some more complex thinking. Um, and I think there's a complexity in the work that we're doing. It doesn't mean that you have to be, um, uh, have a higher education to do this work, but to be able to hold multiple tensions together seems to be um, necessary in, um, in this moment. And so um, when we say political, what we're usually saying is that we're usually talking about Democrat or Republican, you know, we're talking about, you know, this, this, these, these great divides. And when, when I'm understanding the word political, this kind of the, the this, this, this uh, movement of, of governance or um, philosophical kind of overlays that are for the benefit of, of the people and for the good of the whole and for the common good. There's a sense in which then religion, you place that within that, that core paradigm of love and service and self-giving and equity and th these, these things that we've been talking about today. Then it does become political, but it doesn't become this kind of um, um, left, right, up, down. It becomes this, this organizing principle that sits at the heart of one's community that says, um, whether that's uh, Dr. King's work about the beloved community, whether that's the way that Cleve has been describing kind of this mutual collaboration and these mutuality of relationships within that, but we're looking for an alternative um, way of, of relating to, to each other and that we'll have Obviously, it will have political implications. It'll have social implications. It'll have any category that we can kind of put over that, because um, um, that's that's what transformation is is about. It will be for the transformation of the whole. Thank you. I've come on up here uh, on uh, near the top of the hour. Um, let me let me ask this final question. It's an aspirational question. Um, what and it, I think it, it echoes. Um, uh, a reflection from earlier in the call uh, in our conversation. Um, what what gives you hope? What are you hopeful for at this moment? Yeah, for me, I'm, um, I always describe it as, you know, my um, as it relates to all my, my voc vocational aspirations and doings are really related to um, so my, my commitments in service to my values, right? So for me, really, I value community uh, above and beyond anything. I mean, if you can find one or two uh, really meaningful, significant relationships that add meaning and enrich your life, then it's amazing. And, and in this struggle, I think this struggle for justice and equality, I think I found uh, at bottom um, the most sincere kinds of relationships and uh, that I've had in my life that are deeply fulfilling to me, right? And so the, all the, I would say the work of racial equality and justice is hard. You also run into your people if you're committed to it, right? You run into those folk who really add 
significance and meaning to your life in ways that uh, you never thought possible. Uh, I'm an only child. So when I was a younger, younger boy, I always wanted brothers and sisters, right? And I, and I can say over the last five or six years or so, uh, Matt and I have been able to run into a community of folk. Uh, folks, in fact, I consider my siblings uh, here in, in Houston, Texas, uh, from my community, and, and Matt as well. Never thought I'd have a white brother, but he is like a blood brother to me now, right? And uh, five, six years ago, you would have asked me, I would never have thought that possible. In fact, no one who knows me would have thought that would have been, would have been possible. And so I just, I, I just think, you know, my hope is the kind of running into like-minded folk shows me that this is possible. If it can happen with a small collection of people, yeah. then it's possible that it can happen to a larger group of folk, right? So my only goal is to put myself in social circles that it is happening and we're realizing that. And if we can keep on expanding that circle further and further, then hey, we may die off, but maybe somebody else will kind of continue that work as well. Thanks. Ma yeah. Matt, what gives you hope? Mm -hmm. I, I recently heard uh, uh, Willie Jennings say that uh, hope is a discipline. It's a, it's a discipline. And so I think there, particularly within the um, African-American community and within this work, um, because there is a lot of, um, there's, there's both, a, there's a lot of discouragement. There's a lot of things we're up against. Uh, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, Cleve and I sitting together and we, we uh, really, Drawing on the strength of the civil rights movement, some of the folks there um, remembering um, Fannie Lou Hammer and um, Ella Baker and um, uh, Medgar Evers and, and just the way that they put themselves in to the struggle, Ed King, you know, and, and the way that they paid the price for that. And I think that um, I think Cleve is right. I would just underline that, that the hope I have is not necessarily that the efforts that I'm going to put in are going to change anything. The question I'm asking myself is, can I remain faithful? Um, um, but the hope that I have is in breaking bread with folks that know me that uh, I can, um, I can break down with and, um, and that we can rise up with. Um, and I think that that's the hope I'm finding to continue to do the work because the work is, can be lonely, uh, um, but it's also invigorating. The work can, um, um, can feel like that um, we're moving backwards, but I think what's moving me forwards is this collection of relationships that, uh, that really have engrafted me in and adopted me. Super, thank you. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Matt and Cleve, for your time. Uh, and again, visit www.projectcurate.org for more information about their work. Uh, here on our side, email us at ircp at imgh.org for more information, and especially to receive information about our third episode in the summer series, which will focus on the next generation of leadership in the fight for respect and justice. Visit uh, imgh.org to support programs like the Dialogue Project, Our Faith in Our City series, and a host of other programs that seek to build respect via interreligious and intercultural engagement and education. We also have other so summer programs, including our Dinner Dialogue on August 11th, and we will be rolling out our fall program series in early August, much of which will be virtual. Uh, Dr. Matt Russell, Dr. Cleve Tinsley, um, Project Curate, thank you for your work and thanks for your time and for this conversation. I'm grateful to both of you. Thanks for having us, man. It's a joy to be here. Thanks. Thanks. Until we see each other again, be brave, be kind, find ways to engage and keep in touch. Thanks everyone and have a good day.